Good morning. Welcome once again to our virtual worship service. I don't know if you're watching this live or you're watching this later in the week, but we are so glad to have you here. Um, we are in the midst of this summer already. Uh, it's crazy to think that today we are celebrating the 4th of July and we are doing all of these amazing things, that this is uh, the first Sunday of my second year here at Santee United Methodist Church, and it has been a crazy year at that. I thank you for continuing to come through and watch online with us. Uh, I also want to give you a bit of an announcement. Um, this morning we had our first uh, service with mask optional. We had an 815 mask required and 10 o'clock mask optional service. If that's been the thing that's been keeping you from coming, I hope that you can be a part of that. There are no longer any signups to be a part of any of our services online. But there is another thing that we're hoping to start doing in the next few weeks, which is that we will start uh, recording our services in person uh, in the sanctuary, which means that the, the way that we do this is going to change a little bit, but it also means that it won't be coming out uh, live or on Sundays. Likely we'll need some time to edit and make sure that everything works. Uh, we're thinking maybe having those go live on Wednesdays instead of Sundays. Uh, but just to keep, your, uh, keep you aware, we'll be continuing to do this at least through next week and possibly a week after that. But I want you to be aware that that big change might be coming. Again, we are not going to stop doing virtual worship services at all. Um, it might help put down some of the work on uh, our people that prepare all of the different things and hopefully help us to, to continue to have that option for people who need it. Um, in the meantime, uh, we are in the midst of our summer series on You Asked For It, the, the questions you have asked. I always welcome you to share questions, taboo subjects, uh, uh, theories that you have that you've never wanted to talk about because, again, I think that's such an important thing. And today we're going to be talking about a, a really hard one, but a really good one. So I hope that you'll stick around and be there for that. But in the meantime, let us go to God with our prayers and our singing um, and our connection online. Good morning. Let's pray together our opening prayer. God of reconciliation, we greet you with praise and thanks today. Gather us in, guide us, and speak to us today, God. Let our old selves pass away as we are made new creations through the love of Christ Jesus. Amen. is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands of form and high. This is my
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 20. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The word of God for the people of God. Amen.
So as I said before, we are into our fourth week in our summer series, You Asked For It. And it's a series that I've been asking you to ask questions you've always wanted to know the answers to. Um, of course, over the course of that time, perhaps, I've provided, I'm hoping, some, some sort of answers to some questions you had. Maybe questions other people had that you didn't even think to ask. Maybe I just caused you to have more questions. After all, I, I think that's okay, too. Since I said at the beginning of this series, the whole point is not that we give easy answers, but that we have a discussion about these topics that are very difficult, uh, but they are also universally thought about. Uh, they're very important as a result. Many of these questions don't have answers, at least not easy ones. And that's not always the point. Uh, the point is, the only way to grow and perhaps discover what answers fit right with us, help us to figure out some of these things, is uh, out there. And the only way we can learn about them is by talking about what our answers are. Or maybe it'll help us come to be okay with the mystery of not knowing. But you have to start by asking. And you know as well as I do that there are times where you don't want to ask. Maybe you have an, a conclusion, but you're afraid that if you share it with other people, they'll tell you how horrible or heretical or terrible that uh, solution is, or you're just plain wrong. Maybe you've been afraid to ask because it seems like everybody else already has the answers to those things. But again, that's a core reason of why I wanted to do this work, because Despite the fact that there are many difficult topics, and many of them we've talked about, we will talk about, despite the fact that we might vehemently disagree with our solutions to these problems, the conversation, the discussion, the, the growth that happens in the midst of sharing, I believe is holy work. And if you learn nothing out of this whole series. I don't give you any answers and I just make you mad the whole time. At the very least, I hope that you take away this idea that there should be no taboo topics. See, for me, taboo topics, questions that can't be answered uh, or asked, uh, they make us compartmentalize our faith. We separate ourselves from these important things, these important discussions. And when we do it in the church, whether we do it on purpose or, you know, on accident through the ways that we teach things. Well, we start teaching one another, you can't ask that. God's not going to like it. But as anybody knows that's been in a long-term relationship, the most important part of any relationship is communication. That is just as true of God's and your relationship as any other. And if you get to a place where you go, well, I can't talk about that with God because God will get mad at me. Well, it's not going to take very long before you either decide not to have a relationship and just have a, a, a situation where you follow whatever it is that God says and don't have anything to do, or you get to a place where you start resenting that relationship. You see, that's not the God that I believe Jesus Christ taught us about. Instead, God embraces our questions. Honestly, I think God celebrates us in the diversity of our conclusions because I think God wants us to keep open minds that all the possibilities out there might have a kernel of truth in them. As I said, we've already discussed a few difficult questions. We started by talking about why, how and should we read and interpret the Bible? Why does God forgive those that don't deserve it? And why should we forgive those that have hurt us so deeply? Now we get to, in this fourth week, uh, a question I've literally been thinking about since I was a small child. Who will we see in heaven? 
Now, you'll get as many opinions about this subject as you will find people, and I've heard a lot of them in my travels and following in different churches. I've been in fundamentalist churches where they basically taught that if you don't go and follow the exact nature of what we teach in our church, well, you're going to go to hell. I always remember there's an old joke about that, um, about two Christians that come together and one says, well, are you a, a Catholic or a Protestant? And the second says, well, a Protestant, obviously. And he says, oh, good man. Are you a Baptist or a Methodist? Oh, a Baptist. Oh, me too. Good man. Um, of course, we're going to use Baptists as the example, not Methodists. So that's, that's a normal thing for Methodists to do. Um, are you a Baptist that uh, joined after the Reformation of 1870 or the before? And he says, oh, I came after. Good man. We too. Well, are you a Northern Reformed Baptist after the 1870 Reformation or the Southern Baptist? And he says, oh, I'm a Southern Baptist. Oh, I'm a Northern Baptist, so you can rot in hell. It's a, a great joke about the, the ways that we separate even into smaller and smaller divisions. Uh, and in some churches, that is how things go. I've then been greeted with other people who say, oh, no, that's not how God works. God is a God of all Christians. But then is all, I'm also greeted with John fourteen six, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the light. No one goes to the Father except through me. I imagine you've heard that verse from time to time. And many Christians then believe Jesus is the way into heaven. That if you claim Jesus as your Savior, you will receive the salvation he gives. The grace is freely given, as we discussed last week. But you have to claim it. And maybe, you know what, they might be right. Then again, I've also struggled with the more complicated sides of the question that come out of that. How long does somebody have to accept that truth? Is it however long you're alive in this world? Uh, if Does the chance end as soon as your heart stops beating? If so, what about people who never get the chance to learn anything about Jesus? What about the people who are born at the far corners of the world? Live, die without ever encountering Christianity? What about the people that were born before Jesus ever lived? What about the people who find meaning and the God, love of God in religions other than Christianity? Are all of these people destined to be held out of heaven too? Will we not see them in heaven? In fact, the person who asked me this question for this series shared about a dear friend who was Jewish. And as they said, I can't imagine that one day I wouldn't get to see them in heaven. Again, then again, there might be another way that you're thinking about this question. You might not be wondering, who am I going to see in heaven? Instead, you might be asking, am I going to get into heaven? However you've thought of this question before, this is old. And when I mean old, I mean uh, beginning of the world old. Think about the Israelites. They believed that they alone were God's chosen people, which implies... All the other people were not chosen by God. And in the early days of Christianity, that caused many debates on who could and could not receive the salvation of Jesus Christ. I shared a little bit about this last week, that the Christians who had come to faith through Judaism, who likely were the ones who had literally followed and listened to Jesus himself, believed that since Jesus had spent his life following the, law of Jew, the Jewish law, the law of Moses... All of his followers would need to do the same. Heck, there are still many who believe that God's salvation through Jesus Christ was only really meant for the chosen people of God. It was simply something God intended for them alone. So then when Gentiles, people who had grown up outside of Jewish culture, maybe were, uh, um, what are they called, pagans, uh, people that would have followed the Roman uh, religions or other religions around them begin hearing about this Son of God who loves all people, who died for our sins and wants us to live in heaven together, that they would be like, oh, I want to have some of that. Then all of these early Jewish, uh, these Jew Jewish Christians had to decide, what do we do about them? Can Gentiles be in the kingdom of God? Will Gentiles go to heaven? And make no mistake, it was hotly debated. We mainly get to hear some of these discussions in Acts. 
but a lot in Paul's letters. Because at the end of the day, Paul went to people who were not Jewish, to Gentiles all over to share this message. And then some other person would go after him and tell him, well, you can't really be Christian because you're not Jewish. You need to do this. Maybe they didn't even say you need to do this. You just can't be Christians. Of course, Paul is an interesting figure in all of this because he was born and raised as a Jewish man. And more than that, his life before being an evangelist for Jesus Christ was as a Pharisee of the law of Moses. He fought with this question in particular, trying to figure out what the answer was his entire life. And while we only have a few hints of that, I think Paul was likely one of those who asked the latter question, do I deserve to be in heaven? Will I get to be there with God? And more... Many more years um, later, he found his answer, or he found through the, the years, he found his answer in the rigorous application of the law. If I do my very best to follow God's commands, maybe, just maybe, I'll earn my place with God. Even to the point that in the early days of Christianity, he found himself defending the Jewish faith against those heretics who believed that God could have a son and his name could be Jesus. I always picture it almost like um, he was the, the hotshot lawyer from out of town who comes into this synagogue and there's these people saying, we need to all be Christians. We need to follow Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And he comes in and goes, none of that's true. Let me show you the reasons. And then afterwards, he kind of kicked up and went out of town. Uh, he, the truth is he was personally responsible for the first martyrs of the faith. Uh, he had Stephen stoned because of his beliefs. But then Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and everything changed for him because he was suddenly realized that God's love was not earned, it was given. It was to seek that love more fully that we, re, we live, that his job wasn't meant to be spent every waking moment trying to make sure you followed every single law. It was supposed to be lived loving better. Which didn't mean that he got to rest easy. Oh, I don't have to follow all those laws. That's great news. On the contrary, he now saw that the life of following Christ as a privilege and an honor it was something of a task that we we're all made called to take up. That this new life seeking after Jesus, which led him through persecution at the hands of his old friends, imprisonments, and eventually death at the hands of the Roman Empire. Somehow even all of that was worth more than the life of right living he had lived before. You can feel, you can feel that in the new reality throughout Paul's writings. I chose this one from his second letter to the Corinthians. Not because it's unique to Paul or in all of his letters. It's, but because in it... We see him trying to get across to others just what is so important about this gospel he encountered. Now, starting at verse 14, I'm going to repeat. He says, for the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one Jesus Christ has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all so that all those who live might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. In other words, the reason he and his uh, followers are traveling all over the Roman Empire, sharing the gospel, is because the gospel is for all people. And we no longer have to worry, am I getting into heaven? Are you getting into heaven? Because the point is, God has let go of that. And now it's just our job to make sure that you know that God loves you that I know that God loves me. He goes on, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Now, Lots of big words. Paul is always wordy, and it's always hard to use his passages in Scripture. But the gist of what he's trying to say is that God, through Christ, sought through Christ to reconnect the whole world, all of its people, to our Creator. And that now it's our job 
as the people who have come to know that fact first, those who, like Paul, have come to realize how amazing and freely that gift is given, it is our job to make sure all people know it. Now, Paul had moved from very strict legal interpretations of a God as a lawgiver, as a uh, punisher and a rewarder, to the idea of God as a lover of all people. To me, he had moved to a more forgiving understanding of who might be in heaven. It was no longer reserved to the people who followed the law correctly. But that said, I still don't know where Paul stood on the more detailed sticking questions. What happens if somebody doesn't know that truth through Jesus Christ? What happens if somebody dies before accepting it? What if they were devoted to another religion and refused to follow Jesus? I'm not sure what Paul would have said. And that's the rub. And honestly, it's still a difficult question for me. And from this point in my sermon, I will not claim that this is the answer. It is uh, my perspective on this question. And I might be wrong. I think we need to be humble enough to say that at times. You see, part of the reason I shared Paul's story today is because Paul's conversion is something that deeply resonates with me. I, too, spent much of my life worrying about pleasing God with all my actions. I, too, wondered who would and wouldn't be welcome in heaven. As I said, that was a question that filled me with fear from the time I was a young child. I don't know why, but it always was. And there were times when people would even praise me. Oh, you're such a good person, Jamie. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I was always wondering, am I doing enough to be good in God's eyes? Secretly, I imagine I probably wasn't. And yet it was when God revealed an answer to this question, who will we see in heaven? That a question, answer I had never expected myself, that I had what I would call my conversion. It was the, the first step on the road that led me to being a pastor, to become, as Paul says at the end of our passage, an ambassador for Christ. Because I firmly believe, even to this day, God is making his appeal through me so that I can be an instrument through which the world is reconciled to our creator. See, the story started when I was in college. And it was the summer between my sophomore and junior years. And my aunt, my mom's sister, died suddenly. And you have to understand, this person, my Aunt Paula, was one of my favorite people in the whole world. She was that cool aunt everybody wants. The one who got me into horror movies that still a lifelong passion. She was the one who somehow seemed to enjoy playing with an over-energetic kid and games that I'd make up wholesale and she'd just go along for the ride and never seem to get tired of them. She was the one who would take me to an arcade with a bag full of quarters that I know she saved for months, helped me to beat whole games in the course of an afternoon. And I'll, for those of you younger kids among us, an arcade was a place where you would go and put quarters into video games to play them. I know, it's a crazy concept. The point is, though, she was awesome. But she was also the first member of my family who died and hadn't really gone to church. Oh, she grew up Christian, to be sure, but for all sorts of reasons that I probably will never know the extent of she had been badly hurt by the church. So she wasn't really into God. I don't know even if she didn't believe, but she definitely didn't want anything to do with organized religion. And so when she died, on top of being heartbroken that she was gone, I found myself asking a nagging question in the back of my mind. Did she go to heaven? That summer ended up being really hard for a lot of reasons. Not only that my aunt died, but a few weeks after that, my last grandparent, my grandmother, my dad's mother, also died. And we ended up traveling all over the country from St. Louis to Tennessee to back to St. Louis to Houston, Texas, and then from Texas all the way back up to Boston, Massachusetts, so I could go back to school. As you can imagine, driving that long, I had a lot of time for thinking and praying. 
I read books. And in the midst of all of it, I remember vividly that God spoke to me in a way I had never experienced. In fact, I say that still. God spoke to me. And I remember writing that in my ordination papers and my parents kind of saying, are you sure you want to say that God spoke to you? That might make them think you might be a little, a little out there. But it's true. And I realized at that moment that our love is but a mirror to the love God has for us. That the reason and way we love one another is only possible because God first loved us. And even as parents and children or as family or as a significant other, that love we have for people is imperfect compared to the love that God has for us. And so I realized something, that if I got to heaven one day, and my aunt wasn't there, the first question I would ask God is, how do I get her here? Because it's not heaven without Aunt Paula. And the vision I received from God, the, the words I heard were, I'm already working on it. In fact, I sent Jesus to go get her. You see, as Christians, we are taught to believe that Jesus Christ came to bring us eternal life. But if life is eternal, and the love of God follows us forever and always, well, then one day, no matter how long it might take, millions of years perhaps, I expect we will see all people in heaven. Paul says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to us. It's not just the world that accepts God in a timely manner. It's the whole world. Now, again, I want to make something clear. I don't claim to understand the details of that. I don't know how that fits in with John 14, 6, where Jesus says that Jesus is the way and the life and the truth and only we can get to the Father through him. What does that mean about people of different faiths? What does that mean about people of no faiths? But what I do know beyond a doubt is this. God's love transcends death. It transcends time. And we're even told it descended into hell. We're also told that God is like a parent who joyfully welcomes the prodigal son home. And as much as at times we can and likely will run from God, God never stops chasing after us. So in some way, I perhaps will never fully understand. I know beyond a shadow of doubt more than anything I know that as somebody said at one of the ordination retreats I went to, uh, someday, by the grace of God, hell will be empty because we'll all be in heaven together. Now, what does that mean? More than anything, it means that it changes how I live. Because as I said last week, it means that we are all beloved. That we are all worthy, that there is not anyone that we can write off as too far gone. That instead of being gatekeepers or law followers, our job as Christians is to be ambassadors of a new creation, a new kingdom. We are a vanguard who has been given a deliriously beautiful vision of a future where all people, the people past, the people present, the people future, all of them will know love. And it is our great privilege and honor to share that so that we can guide others into the hope that it brings. Amen. Let's pray. God of reconciliation, we are a people who have experienced joy and sorrow this week. We pray to you today as a community of faith. We lift those prayers to you now, Lord, 
and say, hear our prayers, hold us and console us. God, we pray for our church today. Give us clear vision as we lift our heads from this past year of isolation and fear. Give us hearts to listen to each other, to our community, and to our world as we determine our direction and next steps. God, we pray for our country today. Let this be a time of new beginnings, of reconciliation, growth, and peace. We pray for our leaders. Give them wisdom, courage, and patience. We pray for all those who have come before, who believed in the idea of this country we call America, and who worked to build it and strengthen it. As a country in need of healing, give us the wisdom to know what to hold on to and what to leave behind. Guide our actions, God, as we move into an uncertain future. God, you forgive us our guilt and sin, and we are made new creations. As your forgiven people, we strive to forgive others who we believe have sinned against us. Let us serve you as your ambassadors for Christ, changed and new. We pray today as your new creations, reconciled to you, God, and lifting up this prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Once again, we come to the end of our service. I am so grateful that we have had this time to be together. I'm so grateful that you uh, listened in patience my my call story today. I didn't know that I was expecting to do that eventually, originally, but uh, it's so important to me. This is the 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 point at which I knew that I needed to be a pastor, to be an ambassador to this wonderful good news. After I heard it, I remember thinking to myself, why didn't anybody teach me? And it's not fair, because I know that there are other people out there that did teach me that. But it did also make me say, I can't think of anything I'd rather do the rest of my life than try to tell somebody else this amazing truth, that there's nothing to be afraid of, that God's never going to give up on us and that we shouldn't give up on each other. So as you go forth in this day and this week, I I hope that it gives you some sort of a feeling of comfort to know that um, God's love never ends. And I hope that you will become uh, an ambassador as I have been an ambassador to you, that you go forth and share with someone this week. I don't know who they are or where they are, that they are loved, not for what they do, but for who they are. Let us go and share that wonderful news together, but also go and know that God goes with you wherever it is you find yourself. Have a wonderful 4th of July. Have a a great day um, celebrating with your families and know that my prayers go with you. Amen. Thank you.